Okay, evening friends, I'm Dr. Sushant Soni. I'm from Ames Delhi and I'm the pathology faculty with the institute. So starting with the pathology discussion of grand test 181, starting with the first question, that is question 154. Now, have a look at this image without history. No printed question, nothing, without history, without even the markings. What you see here is the stratified squamous epithelium, which is getting converted to columnar type. It is showing the presence of long cells with presence of goblet cells. So columnar with goblet is intestinal type. So squamous getting converted to intestinal lining called as intestinal metaplasia. An easy question. So diagnosis, bad at esophagus. Next point. So the question was, what does this show? Barrett's esophagus, which stain and what will you look for? The answer is D, that is we will do mucin stains and we will look for dysplasia. So question 154, the answer is D, that is Barrett's esophagus, that is Barrett's esophagus, mucin stains, mucin stains and we will look for dysplasia. So this gets us to the point, what is the significance of Barrett's esophagus? Barrett's esophagus, again you very well know, it is pre-malignant. Barrett's esophagus, it is pre-malignant for adenocarcinoma of the esophagus. You know this, the main risk factor of Barrett's being GRD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. So why do we do an endoscopic biopsy in Barrett's to look for dysplasia? How frequently is an endoscopic biopsy performed? In absence of dysplasia, in absence of dysplasia, we do endoscopic biopsy once every year. In absence of dysplasia, we do the biopsy once every year. Next, in presence of low-grade dysplasia, in presence of low-grade dysplasia, it is done once every three to six months, once every three to six months. Whereas in high grade dysplasia, whereas in presence of high grade dysplasia, it is, it is the, what we do is subtotal esophagectomy. In high grade dysplasia, directly, directly a subtotal esophagectomy is performed. That is because high grade dysplasia is at a very high risk of progression to adenocarcinoma esophagus. So directly a subtotal esophagectomy is performed. This is Barrett's esophagus. Next point, before going further, let us have a look at this again. Now have a look at this slide in an unbiased manner. Some students tend to get confused that you are able to see the presence of glands. You are able to see these glands. So is it invasion or not? Look at the glands. They are the normal benign glands. How do I know that? Nuclear polarity is maintained. All the nuclei, they are present on one side of the cell. Nuclear polarity is maintained differentiate these glands from these ones differentiate from these ones these this is again the glandular arrangement all these are the glands but some nuclei are on top some are on bottom with presence of hyperchromasia these are very malignant looking glands these are dirty looking glands so diagnosis adenocarcinoma parent organ could be of anywhere it is not adenocarcinoma esophagus because the parent organ is not there. It can be oral cavity, esophagus, stomach, cervix, vagina, uterus, can be anywhere, adenocarcinoma. So again, have a look at the normal benign gland versus malignant adenocarcinoma. Next, now look at the normal squamous epithelium. This is what the squamous epithelium looks like. And look at this slide. What this shows us is a malignancy. How do I know it is a malignancy? Because we have the presence of cells and clusters with prominent nucleoli. With prominent nucleoli. It is a malignancy of squamous origin. Squamous cell carcinoma with presence of a keratin pearl. With presence of a keratin pearl. So this is what squamous cell carcinoma and adenocarcinoma looks like. Next point. Next point. This gets us to our next question. That is question 155. 
this gets us to our next question 155 cell growth can be stopped so which stage of cell cycle demonstrates the primary point in cell regulation we have two checkpoints in cell cycle g1s and g2m primary checkpoint end of g1 so question 155 question 155 the answer is b that is end of g1 end of g1 next point next point much more important than the checkpoints there are two checkpoints g1s g2m which is the more important checkpoint g1s much more important than this is how are the checkpoints crossed they are crossed by cyclins binding to checkpoints they are crossed today the pen is giving some issues cyclins binding to cyclin dependent kinases so let us make a table of this there are two checkpoints G1S, G1S and G2M, G1S and G2M. We will start making the table from below. Cyclin A and B, cyclin A and B help in crossing G2M. Cyclin C is not there. Cyclin D and E help in crossing G1S. Cyclins bind to cyclin dependent kinases. So CDK21, CDK21, CDK1. Next, CDK3 is not there. CDK3 is not there. CDK46, CDK46, CDK2, CDK2. This is the master table of cyclins binding to cyclin dependent kinases next point next point which is the main checkpoint g1s g1s which is the main cyclin responsible for crossing g1s cyclin d binding to cdk4 the main cdk is cdk4 next which is the main cyclin for crossing g2m cyclin b binding to cdk1 this is question 155 next this gets us to our next question that is 156 phenomena where subsequent generations are at an increased risk is called as anticipation that is question answer 4 d anticipation 156 anticipation anticipation this is seen in non mendelian inheritance Anticipation, this is a phenomena seen in non-Mendelian inheritance. And which non-Mendelian inheritance? Non-Mendelian inheritance, it is of three types. Non-Mendelian inheritance, it is of three types. That is genomic imprinting, trinucleotide repeats, and mitochondrial inheritance. Fourth, fourth is gonadal mosaicism, which is vegetarian. So it is seen in non-Mendelian inheritance. Which type? the trinucleotide repeat type non mendelian inheritance trinucleotide repeats non mendelian inheritance trinucleotide repeats next point next point what what is why does anticipation occur anticipation this is also called as sherman's paradox anticipation it is also called as sherman's paradox this occurs because with successive generations mutation increases in meiotic division see the mutation the mutation increases the mutation increases during oogenesis the mutation in trinucleotide repeats increases during oogenesis so, if the mother is in a pre-mutated state, her child will be in a mutated state. So, with successive generation, the mutation is increasing. This is called as anticipation or Sherman's paradox seen in trinucleotide repeat disease. The classical, the classical example of trinucleotide repeat disease is Fragile X syndrome. Fragile X, Huntington's is also trinucleotide. You, wrote, you know that. Next, next. This to question 157. Now, what we see here is 
a 70 male working in asbestos factory, biopsy was taken from the mass which is seen on electron microscopy. See the minute the examiner is talking of asbestos factory, which is the most specific neoplasm associated with asbestos is mesothelioma. So, the examiner is asking the electron microscopic feature of mesothelioma which shows long slender microvilli that is answer A. Question 157, the answer is A, that is long slender microvilli. It shows the presence of long slender microvilli, long slender microvilli. Now, the, we have already seen that the most specific, most specific malignancy associated with asbestos is mesothelioma, mesothelioma versus the most common malignancy versus the most common malignancy associated with asbestos is that is lung adenocarcinoma. So differentiate between the two questions most specific mesothelioma most common adenocarcinoma. On electron microscopy on electron microscopy mesothelioma shows the presence of long slender microvilli versus adenocarcinoma which on electron microscopy shows short plump microvilli which on electron microscopy shows short plump microvilli so before we go further let us have a look at what it looks like on electron microscopy now what you see in this image is the presence of all these elongated microvilli which is mesothelioma versus versus the short plump microvilli you are able to make out that these are the short plump microvilli adenocarcinoma so mesothelioma versus adenocarcinoma <coughs> sorry next next this gets us now before i go further unfortunately i missed one question that is question 157 this was 158 most common nephropathy associated with malignancy is mgn membranous glomerulonephritis that is option 4 question 157 this was 158 which the answer to question 157 is d that is mgn c it is easy there are four main primary nephrotic syndromes mcd mgn mpgn fsgs minimal change disease membranous glomerulonephritis membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis focal segmental glomerulosclerosis out of these mgn is the one which is most commonly associated with malignancies so let us have a look at causes of mgn causes the most common cause of mgn is idiopathic that is the cause is unknown the most common cause is idiopathic other causes are infections other causes are infections easy to remember hepatitis b hepatitis b c b c syphilis malaria and schistosomiasis hepatitis b c syphilis, malaria and schistosomiasis and schistosomiasis. Next malignancies, next malignancies that is carcinoma lung, that is carcinoma lung, colon and melanoma. Malignancies, carcinoma lung, colon and melanoma and the last is SLE, systemic lupus erythematosus which class of SLE class 5 class 5 remember class 5 lupus is membranous lupus nephritis so these are the causes of MGN next this gets us to our next question that is question 159 this gets us to the next one that is 159 now starting with 159 which is correct about the nuclear and the cytoplasmic changes seen in necrosis. Now what you see in this image, let me enlarge this, starting with the first image, you are seeing a, a cell with clumped chromatin that is pycnosis, pycnosis versus second where it is fragmentation of the nucleus, 
carried excess. In the third image, the nucleus is gone. Dissolution, cariolysis. So the answer is A. Pycnosis, carried excess, cariolysis. A, B, and C. So question 159, the answer is A. That is pycnosis, that is pycnosis, cariorexis, cariorexis, and cariolysis and cariolysis. Next point. Next point. What do what does this mean? Pycnosis is shrinkage, nuclear shrinkage. Cariorexis is fragmentation of the nucleus, whereas cariolysis is dissolution. Next, this gets us to the next question. That is question 160. Now, which is true about the image shown? Let us just have a look at the image. This is a blood vessel. How do I know it's specific to the luminal structure? Blood vessel showing where is the problem? This area which is present on the bottom, which has a slightly different color to it, something is getting deposited in the muscle layer of the blood vessel. That is, muscle layer is tunica media. So, calcification of tunica media called as Monkeberg's arteriosclerosis or Monkeberg medial sclerosis. So question 160, the answer is A, that is Monkeberg's medial sclerosis. Monkeberg medial sclerosis. Next point, what is Monkeberg's medial sclerosis? It is which calcification? Dystrophic or metastatic? This is dystrophic. Serum calcium is normal. This is dystrophic calcification. Dystrophic calcification of tunica media. Dystrophic calcification of tunica media of vessel wall. Dystrophic calcification of tunica media of vessel wall. Next, does it obstruct the lumen? No, it was seen in the vessel wall. This does not obstruct the lumen. This does not obstruct the lumen of the blood vessel. So there is no alteration in the blood flow. Last point, increased incidence. Increased incidence is associated with, increased incidence is associated with aging, SLE. Increased incidence is with aging, SLE and diabetes. Aging, SLE and diabetes. Next, next. This gets us to the next question, that is question 161. This gets us to the next one. The pattern of inheritance. Now, again have a look at the image. What this shows us is the presence of elongated elliptical RBCs, that is hereditary elliptocytosis, HE, hereditary elliptocytosis, which is autosomal dominant in inheritance. So question 161, the answer is B, that is autosomal dominant. It was a case of hereditary elliptocytosis. It was a case of HE, hereditary elliptocytosis. Let me read it for you, hereditary elliptocytosis. The RBCs were elliptical in shape. Next, next, this gets us to the next question. That is 162. Now, 34-year-old G1, P0, her siblings are not inheritance pattern. It's uh, many things are written in this. Let us just have a look at the pedigree chart. Now, what we see in this pedigree chart is we have a carrier female. The one with the dot in the center is the carrier female who is mating with a normal male. As a result of which, this is C. Firstly, this is not autosomal dominant. These are the four inheritances, mitochondrial. Of course, it is not mitochondrial because mitochondrial, if the female is affected, all the children are affected. Mitochondrial is out. This is not autosomal dominant, not autosomal recessive because autosomal recessive it does not, with a normal male, it does not have an affected child. Affected should have been zero. So have a look at this. This is the carrier, it is X-linked recessive. Let us assume this female to be x dot y, the, uh, that is x dot x, mating with a normal male x y. As a result, the female child is a carrier, x dot x, the female child is a carrier, whereas one male child is affected. 
because that affected X chromosome went to the male. When this normal, when this affected male mates with a normal female, then, then let me draw this for you. Let me draw this for you. Just a sec. What we had was the affected female mating with normal male as a result of which we had one affected male we had one affected male and one carrier female the other female was normal this is how it is going next point when this carrier when this affected male mates with a normal female this x dot this goes to the carrier female whereas when the carrier female mates with a normal male then again we have this x dot will go with one y one x we have one affected male one uh, one carrier female see when this mates with a normal male we will have one carrier female and one affected male this is the pedigree that is shown so what is the inheritance pattern it is x linked recessive inheritance it is x linked recessive inheritance <laughs> point this gets us to the next question that is question 163 163 now how to new receptor in breast cancer you very well know the IHC classification of breast cancer we divide IHC into three types ER PR her to new her to new receptor it is used for predicting the response to therapy that is question number one 163 that is question 163 the answer is C that is predicting the response to therapy predicting response to therapy breast cancer classification we divide it into three types we divide it into three types that is ER positive, ER positive I don't know positive her to new negative, her to new positive, her to new positive, and triple negative. Triple negative is ER, PR, her to new negative. First point, most common, 1, 2, 3, most common, ER positive, her to new negative. How common? 40 to 55 percent. 40 to 55 percent, ER positive, her to new negative. Least common, triple negative. Least common, triple negative. Best prognosis, 1. Worst prognosis, triple negative. Next point, triple negative microscopically is associated with which, which feature, which morphology? Medullary morphology. Microscopically, it is associated with medullary morphology. And it is called as basal-like tumor triple negative is called as basal like tumor why because it is positive for basal or myoepithelial cell markers basal like tumor next point most common familial gene with triple negative BRCA1 most common familial gene with triple negative BRCA1 present on chromosome 17 versus ER positive HER2 negative where the most common familial gene is BRCA2 present on chromosome 13 present on chromosome 13 this is breast cancer classification and it is used for predicting the response to therapy next this gets us to our next question that is question 164 most common cytogenetics in mds is one isolated deletion of chromosome 5 10a the answer is one the answer is 1. Question 164. Question 164. The answer is A. That is deletion of chromosome 5. Deletion of chromosome 5. Now, isolated deletion of chromosome 5. This is the most common cytogenetics in MDS. Next point. This is usually seen in adults. So, I can rephrase this as most common cytogenetic abnormality in MDS in adults in MDS in adults is again isolated deletion of chromosome 5 
that is minus 5 q long arm short for short arm long arm minus 5 q versus in children versus in children where the most common is monosomy 7 where the most common is monosomy 7 so adults deletion of chrome, long arm of chromosome 5 children monosomy 7 I, in adults it has a better prognosis so deletion of chromosome 5 q better prognosis versus versus monosomy 7 which is poor prognosis versus monosomy 7 which is poor prognosis done next okay okay so this gets us to our next question that is question 165 coming to question 165 just have a look at the microscopy. I'm not concerned in that it is a nerve sheet tumor, cerebrofontine angle, CP angle, not concerned. Just look at the microscopy. This is the classical microscopy of Shanoma. Now, Shanoma shows us two areas, Antony A and Antony B Shanoma. Shanoma, it shows the presence of two areas, that is Antony A and Antony B areas. Antony A are the hypercellular areas versus Antony B, which is the hypocellular area. Next, you very well know Schwannoma, it is associated with the presence of Veruque bodies. Veruque bodies, Veruque bodies, they are small eosinophilic structures. They are small eosinophilic structures <coughs> with peripheral palisading of tumor cells. Now, now, if the tumor cells are more and the bodies are smaller, it is hypercellular. This is Antony A schwannoma. Whereas, if the pink areas are bigger and the cells are tumor cells are well spread apart, it is Antony B area. Now, let us have a look at what is shown in the image. You have two areas. The blue arrow, the tumor cells are well spread apart. It is an edematous area. That is, this is Antony B area. It is Antony B. Whereas the black arrow, the tumor cells are present clustered together. So left side is Antony A versus right side, which is Antony B. So the answer is C. That is Antony B pattern, Veruque body. The answer is C. That is Antony B pattern, Antony B pattern, Veruque body. Next, this gets us to the next question. That is question 166. Question 166. Marker for Paget's disease of the breast. The marker is CEA, Casino Embryonic Antigen. See, we very well know 166. The answer is A, that is CEA. Casino embryonic antigen, we very well know it is a tumor marker. It is a tumor marker of adenocarcinoma, of adenocarcinoma colon, pancreas, breast, lungs, and ovary. Casino embryonic antigen, it is non specific in nature. It is a tumor marker for colon, pancreas, lung, breast, and ovary. Pager's disease, breast, tumor marker, CA. Next, the other options in the question were HMB 45, HMB 45 and S100. Both of these are the immunohistochemistries, IHCs for melanoma, for melanoma, out of which HMB 45 is more specific for melanoma. Next, last option was synaptophysin. Last option was synaptophysin. Synapto, synaptophysin, which is positive in the neuroendocrine tumors. Synaptophysin, which is positive in neuroendocrine tumors. Neuroendocrine tumors like small cell carcinoma or that is again NAC positive uh, or synaptophysin and chromogranin, which is positive in, in, in carcinoid tumors. So the answer to the question was CA. Next. Question 167. Next, question number 167. Gross examination of a kidney with malignant hypertension. Gross of malignant hypertension, it shows the classical flea appearance. 
flea beetle is small small hemorrhages on multiple small hemorrhages on the petechial surface. So, the answer is P that is question 167 malignant hypertension grossly malignant hypertension grossly shows the classical flea bitten appearance shows the classical flea bitten appearance of the kidney which has multiple small hemorrhages which has multiple small hemorrhage on renal capsule the bp is very high so the capillaries rupture giving rise to flea bitten appearance next point light microscopy light microscopy shows us two features fibrinoid necrosis malignant hypertension light microscopy shows us two features fibrinoid necrosis and onion skin appearance fibrinoid necrosis and onion skinning which is arising because of hyperplastic arteriolitis hyperplastic arteriolitis see you very well know in malignant hypertension the bp is very high so the muscle layer so the muscle layer around the blood vessel undergoes concentric hyperplasia which is called as onion skin appearance next point which is more specific with malignant hypertension flea bitten uh, fibrinoid necrosis or onion skinning onion skinning this is more specific why because fibrinoid necrosis is associated with diseases other than malignant hypertension also so specific onion skin appearance next this gets us to our next question that is question 168 this gets us to our next one 168 70 male retired personal temporal headache blooding of vision biopsy of temporal artery now there are so many hints about this question telling you that the answer that the diagnosis in this case is giant cell arteritis giant cell arteritis how do i know this it is a large vessel vasculitis just touch your forehead once and you will forever remember it giant cell arteritis this is tender palpable T palpable hai, so palpate kar kar ke tender tender palpable temporal artery involvement tender palpable temporal artery involvement because the temporal artery is involved it is also associated with ophthalmitis ophthalmitis so blooding of vision this can lead to sudden blindness this can lead to sudden blindness so giant cell arteritis is a medical emergency it can lead to sudden blindness so it is a medical emergency next point next point so let us have a look at the question now all are true except your options are now i need not even look at the image to know that it is a granulomatous vasculitis you see the presence of numerous giant cells all the cells marked with the arrow they are multiple nuclei giant cells so it's a giant cell arthritis granulomatous in nature so granuloma formation transmural inflammation and biopsy relieves the symptoms these are true what is not true is D that is necrotizing vasculitis so question 168 the answer is D that is necrotizing vasculitis necrotizing vasculitis next next this gets us to our next question that is question 169 this gets us to our next one 169 all of the following about the condition are true except this shows the presence of giant cells with granuloma it is a non caseous granuloma i'm not able to see caseous necrosis this is a non caseous granuloma with giant cells Mo diagnosis this is a chest x-ray bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy diagnosis non caseating granuloma with bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy sarcoidosis now do, let us have a look at the options which is not true bilateral hyalur lymphadenopathy with caseating nahi bache it is non caseating so the first option is wrong quim sills back is an intradermal text 
main cell is the CD4 positive T cell. So in bronchial villi lavage, 4 to 8 ratio is more than 3.5 is to 1. And Lofgren syndrome, that is sarcoidosis, arthralgia, and uveitis. So it leads to uveitis. Options B, C, D are true. Question 169, the answer is A. Answer is A, that is that is KZ, bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy, bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy with caseating granulomas. Please note they are non caseating granulomas, non caseating. Let us have a look at other options. The main cell, main cell in sarcoidosis is the CD4 positive T cell. So in bronchioalveolar lavage, CD4 to CD8 T cell ratio of more than 3.5 is to 1 is suggestive of sarcoidosis. Next, Quim Sills back procedure, though it is an obsolete test. What was that? In that, suppose I had a suspected case of sarcoidosis. I took the splenic extract of the known case and ejected it in the suspected. It is an intradermal injection of splenic extract of known patient of sarcoidosis into the suspect case. This is, an, uh, this is an obsolete test. It is not performed now, but it was used for sarcoidosis. And of course, Lofgren's syndrome, Lofgren's syndrome, which was associated with arthritis, arthritis, sarcoidosis, 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 and uveitis, and uveitis. This is, this is, Lofgren's syndrome. So Lofgren syndromes is associated with uveitis. This is true. So the answer is A. Next, this gets us to our next question. That is question number 170. Which of the following is seen in peripheral smear? Now, let us have a look at the cells that you are seeing in peripheral smear you are able to see the presence of, look at the one I am showing with my arrow, you are able to see the presence of a teardrop RBC. With, have a look at the neutrophils. They are hyposegmented. This only has two nuclei. This has three. Many are single. So hyposegmented neutrophils with the presence of band cells. This is a band cell. The one which is in a U shape is a band cell. So answer is one. Band cells teardrop RBCs and hyposegmented neutrophils. 170, the answer is A, that is band cells, teardrop RBCs, teardrop RBCs and hyposegmented neutrophil. A pretty easy one for that matter. Next, this gets us to our last question, that is 171. Histological changes characteristic of atypical hyperplasia in postmenopausal female. The minute, see, do not be biased that it is postmenopausal, so menstrual type endometrial or atrophy or whatsoever. Not at all. Have a look at the question. Atypical hyperplasia. Hyperplasia, the, gland, the number of cells is increasing. So, answer is A. There is crowding of endometrial glands with budding and epithelial atypia. See, this was obvious. Atypical hyperplasia. So epithelial atypia will be present with hyperplasia. So crowding of endometrial glands. 171. The answer is A. That is crowding of endometrial glands. Crowding of endometrial glands with budding. With budding and epithelial atypia. This is atypical hyperplasia. Done. So this takes care of the pathology discussion of Grand Test 171. There were slight technical issues, but I guess they were sorted out in the end. In case Bache, you have any queries whatsoever, just email them to me at sushantesuni, sushantesuni at gmail.com. My name is Sushant Soni. There is an extra S in this, sushantesuni at gmail.com. And I guess overall it was a pretty easy paper. Done. Thank you, auntie.